honor and praise. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. And as you're seated, turn your Bible to the book of Matthew, the gospel according to Matthew. And today we are going to be in chapter 6. We'll be focusing on verses 9 through 15 as we continue to go through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, his instruction to his disciples of what the Christian life looks like. What does it mean that we follow Jesus? We walk according to his pattern that he set down before us. How is it that we understand our life as a whole? And so we're going to continue on in our study uh, that uh, through this. Um, again, I'm going to start reading in verse 5 here in just a moment. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. We do have Bibles out in the foyer if you'd like to pick up one. Uh, please, I encourage you, follow along in your own copy of God's Word. Uh, whenever we get, because you never know what note you're going to want or underline thing or what God will put on your heart. Uh, by the way, just a personal note before I uh, delve into this. Not only happy Mother's Day to you, and I know we're all thinking about our mothers uh, today, and, and many of us will want to have a chance to give them a call, and they're in our prayers. Um, you know, just on a personal note, my uh, wife and I have the joy of welcoming a, a grandson into the world here. So we're both grandparents as of last Sunday. Uh, Liam, my son Liam. My, my son Liam and his wife Myra uh, last Sunday had a baby boy named Daniel Elijah. Daniel Elijah Whiteneck, 8 pounds, 14 ounces. I, I, I've not met him yet. Julie has. But I look forward to uh, meeting him myself, but also you all having a chance to meet him because uh, Liam is one of the covenant children of this church. So many of you have blessed him. And, and I just do, I'm so encouraged to see generation to generation, um, you, you know, you're pouring into him and to others just continue to grow from generation to generation, what God will do. So anyways, thank you for your prayers for that. And, um, and we look forward to, I look forward to meeting him and having you meet him, as I said. Um, so Matthew chapter 6, I'm going to start reading in verse, eight, or verse 5, and then we're going to go all the way through 15. We're going to continue the section through the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is teaching on prayer. Uh, Matthew 6, 5. Jesus said, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Verse 7, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Verse 9, pray then like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is the word of God. The grass withers, the flower fades, with the word of our God, it stands forever. Would you pray with me? Father, as we come to this text, we ask that you would instruct us by it. Father, we need instruction in prayer. But more than just the instruction of it, God, we need to consider our own prayer lives. None of us probably, very few of us here would have a prayer life which would be exemplary. Every one of us needs help as we consider our prayer, our prayer life, what we pray about, what we think about, what we bring to you in the time that we do it. And so, Father, as we just take time to do this, just... Uh, as you examine our hearts, as we examine our hearts, we pray, God, that you would send a proper Holy Spirit conviction on us. Father, not, not, uh, not a, a selfish guilt or an emotional guilt, but one that, that comes and just saying, what is it that we can grow in and how can we take a next step? So, Father, as we go through this, we pray, Lord, that you'd be glorified and honored in our time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, as I, we've already talked, it's Mother's Day, and it may be, consider, may be uh, proper to consider uh, prayer on this day, because there is enormous power in a praying parent. It's not the exclusive 
work of a mother, of course. Uh, and much can be said about the even greater importance of a playing father. But many of us know the goodness of a mother who has prayed for us. Some of us are here only because we, we know that we had a mama who was behind us praying for us that we would be here. And so we're going to get into this or look at uh, the Lord's Prayer today in its context. Uh, starting in verse 5, what Jesus has shown us is how common it is to miss the very point of prayer. We saw that as we look at verses 5 and 8, where some treat it like a performance. Look at me while I dazzle you with my erudite prayers unto the Lord. Others babble in prayer, practically trying to convince God uh, that he should listen to them, he should answer them. The idea of, Lord, if I repeat this hundreds of times with enormous emotion, well, then you'll maybe listen to me. And something is similar in both of these failures. We looked at this a bit, a bit last week, and both fail to see God as Father. We're going to get into that this week as so we look at the Lord's Prayer. Both fail to see God as a person. One treats God as if he's not really there, and the other treats him as if he can be manipulated. And because both do not see him as a father and they do not see him as personal, they fail to pray in a way that he wants us to pray. People often misunderstand the purpose of prayer. They can treat it as a ritualistic, mechanical activity, almost like a mantra, missing its essence, missing the fact that it's a relational and communicative act that we have with God, we are talking with God. And there is a kind of prayer that God does not want. We see that in verse eight, where Jesus says, do not be like them. In today's world, many think that God is just lucky if he would hear from us. We're like the adult child who says, my mom is lucky if I call home once a month. But it's the opposite. It is really us who have that bless, that, that, that enormous blessing to have access to God in prayer. And as such, we want to learn how it is that we pray to him. I mean, it's not to say that we need to be hyper-conscious of our prayers and the way that we do it. We pray with a childlike faith. All our conversation with God has a sort of a, a lisp to it. It has a, a, a child's-like talk. To God, there's a hymn that says, When this poor, lispering, stammering tongue lies silent in the grave, then in nobler, sweeter song I'll sing thy power to save. But we all know a poor, lisping, stammering tongue, whether it's in our songs or whether it is in our personal prayers to God. We're like the children with a speech impediment talking to him, and he still delights to hear those prayers. So we don't have to be perfect. We don't have to be uptight in it. We can be confident and personal as we pray, but we're also going to be considerate and thoughtful as we pray. What Jesus did is to come to bring us to God. He came to show us God, and part of that is how we should be praying. And that's one of the things that was lost because of sin, the ability to to pray, maybe as you consider your own life, in a time of your life where you never thought to pray. Maybe you're in it right now. Maybe, you're, maybe you've had times where you just didn't know what to say or even how to pray. Maybe, maybe it was out loud. And you saw people around you. Well, they all seem to know how to pray. Why don't I know how to do that? It's a little uncomfortable. What Jesus came to do is restoring us to prayer, to restore us to that conversation with our God so that that, that relationship is restored, that we can talk to him. And so as Jesus teaches us as his disciples to pray, he shows us to focus on God who is our Father, and he shows us the things that matter to God. What is the things that we should be talking to God about? Can you think about meeting somebody really important, you know, a the president or, or person you really look up to, what kind of conversation would you have? If you've been like me and maybe you were with somebody that you really looked up to, you were, were with them and it was a little awkward because you really wanted that time to go well and, and you didn't want to look like just such a flattering fan who was just so amazed by being with them, but you wanted to use the time well. And, and so what could you possibly think to talk about? 
How could you actually make a connection? Say something that connects you with them? You know, we're coming before Almighty God. And prayer is talking to him. And the question we uh, might ask as we look to prayer is one we might ask, we're talking to that person that we uh, so greatly admire, is what does God care about? What is, what is important to him? And so what we see as we get into the Lord's Prayer, starting in verse 9, is that Jesus doesn't tell us what not to do. That's kind of verses 5 through 8, but he really shows us a model for how we are to pray, how it is we are to talk to God. It's called the Lord's Prayer. Jesus never calls it the Lord's Prayer, but it's what we call it. We can see some things as we look at it. The first thing we're going to see as we look at it is that it is a model. It's not necessarily something we need to recite. Now, it is okay to recite it. In fact, if you don't know how to pray well, it is a great place to start. Maybe when you're anxious and you're in your car or you're alone. You know, that is a prayer that we can pray as we learn how to pray. If you look at Luke 11, verse 2, you can write that down. Luke 11, verse 2, Jesus, again, it's another time he's teaching on prayer. Teaches a similar form with this. And he uses slightly different form, again, showing that it's, it's not you know, a rigid formula, but it's a model for us to follow. But he does say in that case, he says, when you pray, say. So you might wonder, well, why is it that we say it? Why was it we recite it? Because it's okay to recite it. He gave it as something that we could recite. But even if we do that, we we're always remembering that it is a model. If you look at, again, Matthew 6, 9, there he says, pray then like this. It's a model. It's, it's not something that necessarily has to be recited. So as a model, each part of it, each line in it teaches us something. That's helpful because even as we do recite it, as we do on our Sunday mornings, is we might think about something with each line because each line means something significant to us as we pray. And this is then something that Jesus gives to us so we can use it kind of to, to organize things, to think about what, it, what is it that I need to pray about or to think about the things we do pray about and see if there's things that we're maybe leaving out, maybe things that we need to make as a regular part of our own conversation with God. And that's that model. There's other models. Some of you learned a ACTS, right? Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication is a sort of a pattern for prayer. Some of you have, uh, maybe use a prayer list to know what to pray through, or maybe I use prayer cards to pray through things. But what's the model that Jesus gave to us? It is in the Lord's Prayer. A model for us to follow the standard by which all prayers are evaluated. And it shows us how expansive our prayers can be. So what we're going to do this week, and if I don't finish today, maybe another week, kind of grew on me over the last few days. And my watch broke, by the way. So I don't know if any of you have lunch appointments, but... But, um, but seriously, um, as we go through it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look through the Westminster Shorter Catechism and what it says about it. Uh, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, if you don't know, it is a question-answer format, uh, which is part of the doctrinal standards, the, the beliefs of our uh, denomination, part of the Presbyterian Church in America. We believe that it, it accurately um, explains... The Bible. I have the questions on prayer listed in your bulletin. It's on the place where the, where the outline usually is. And they're very helpful. The, the catechism is very helpful in understanding what is it the Bible teaches, what's the main message of it, and even as we look through the Lord's prayers, you know, what does the Lord's prayer uh, teach us? Part of the reason I like to do this is because, especially if you're a parent or um, you want to bring it home, is, you know, you can just take those questions and answers and work through them on your own with your children, or maybe in a personal study this week, you can consider uh, each one of them, you know, because what is it that the Lord's Prayer is teaching us? And it really starts, if you look at question 99 there, I think we have slides on these too, yeah, it says, uh, what rule has God given for our direction in prayer? We read the whole word of God is of use to direct us in prayer, but a special use, but the special rule of direction is that form of prayer which Christ taught his disciples, commonly called the Lord's Prayer. 
Before we even go into all the points, we see something here which is very important that we can use the whole Bible to help us to pray. It's one of the ways I encourage every family, uh, every household, uh, around dinner table, you finish dinner, you read the scripture and you pray. And maybe you use that, and you use that passage of scripture just to, be the, to open up your prayer. You know, maybe you're um, you know, praying about loving your neighbor as yourself. And you can start off a prayer. At the, you know, maybe read the Good Samaritan story or something like that. And you can start off your prayer, God teach us to be Good Samaritan. So all of the Bible, wherever you go inside of it, is a helpful guide to help us to pray. And so it's part of the reason why we want to read the Scripture. Because, again, it expands our prayers. You read through the Bible as a whole. So you read through the New Testament as a whole, whatever it is. You know, it expands our prayers if we use that in order to teach us how to pray. Again, our prayers can be so limited what we think about, we're praying for health, for the loved ones, we're praying for health, for ourselves. we're praying for overcoming this one particular challenge. Scriptures and the Lord's Prayer, they get us to think outside of just what's happening um, inside of our lives. All right, so let's, but, all right, so that's kind of the overall principle. You can use the whole Bible, but what about the Lord's Prayer? Let's look at that specifically, because that's what Jesus gave that to us. And we see before we ask for anything, um, we recognize the one that we're speaking to. There's a preface that's given. There's the, the opening line which is given. That's question 100 there. It says, what does the preface of the Lord's Prayer teach us? The preface of the Lord's Prayer, which is, our Father who is in heaven, it teaches us to draw near to God with all holy reverence and confidence as children to a Father, able and ready to help us, and that we should pray with and for others. We see right here, in the very opening of the Lord's Prayer is the recognition that God is our Father. Because if we, if God is really our Father, that is going to affect, affect our prayers. If he is a Father, and he is a good Father, he's ready to hear us. And so we should be confident in our prayers to him. Now, some of us have not had good fathers growing up. And, and we may say, you know, I don't really know what it is to have a good father father in my life, and there's sort of this this hunger that we have inside of us. But even that hunger points towards something of who God is, that a hunger of a father who's interested in our life, a father who is attentive to what our needs are, a father who is attentive to the bigger principles of life and able to guide us through that. That is what God is for us as we come to him through faith in Jesus Christ. God becomes our father as we believe in Jesus. And so those of us who have not had father figures who have directed us or established us or even in the ways that any father falls short, we see the perfection is ultimately in God our Father who is in heaven. He's ready to hear us. We go confidently to him in prayer. But also as a father, we go to him with respect. Right? He is our father who is in heaven. Not only is he our father, and fathers we see throughout the Bible, children, honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord has given you. Um, Not only is our father who deserves respect in that way, but he's, he's God, he's also in heaven. He's in a glorious place. Here we are on earth. We see the difference between us and him. Even the difference between our earthly fathers and our heavenly father, the one who is spiritual, eternal, who wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth. And so we see and seeing that, that difference that is there, there is respect that is given in our prayers. We can think about our own prayers. Are they given with respect even to a father who loves us? You know, that is possible. You know, that there is a God who, you know, demands respect and honor, but yet can be caring and loving. We see that in God. We especially see it because of what he did for us in Jesus. We also see that as a father, that we are dependent on him like children are to their father, and so we pray as those who are dependent. What would we have in this world if not for our father who is in heaven that we can speak to? What would we have unless he would provide for us life and breath and food and all the things that we need? We remember how dependent we are on him for everything. We'd like to think we're self-sufficient, but we are not. And lastly, I'd like to say if he is our father, we need to remember that he is the father of others also, right? So as we look around, we see others who have been adopted in his family. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, we looked at this a little bit last week, he has adopted you into his family. He is your father, but so has adopted um, everyone else who's believed in Christ 
It's all a part of grace. It's all part of that bigger family. And because of that, right, we see we have a responsibility to pray with others. We see we have a responsibility to pray for others. That's something we can't neglect. We're not just individuals in a dark room just singing and praying to God. No, we're in a congregation together where we see each other, we hear each other um, sing and pray. It's not something we neglect as we recognize that God is building his spiritual family, which is through Jesus Christ. We're praying with the others of God's children. All right, so that's the preface. Our Father, who is in heaven. We see this first petition. So there's basically six petitions that are in there. Six requests. Six prayer requests. Big overarching prayer requests that we might put before God. So question 101 in the Shorter Catechism, it um, asks this question, what do we pray for in the first petition? Again, the first prayer request that we make in the Lord's Prayer is the answer is in the first petition, which is, hallowed be your name. We pray that God would enable us and others to glorify him in all that whereby he makes himself known and he would dispose all things to his own glory. So it's interesting. What is the first prayer request? It's not about my aunt's health or a broken toenail or something like that. It is about God's glory. That's what we want. That's the thing that steers our prayers. Hallowed is another word for holy. And so this is a prayer that is saying, Lord, we want your name to be seen as holy. You are so good. We want people to know you who you you are. You are so glorious and so powerful and mighty and so just. We want people to see you for all that you have done. We want to see your name great in the world. You know, that's, that's part of what we're thinking about when we pray, hallowed be your name. This is something that's closely connected with the Ten Commandments, isn't it? The third commandment of the Ten is, you shall not take the Lord's name in vain. You know, we're talking about God's reputation on earth. And our prayer is that God's reputation here on earth would match his true character. His reputation on earth would match his true love and his justice. And that people would see that and worship and glorify him for, for that. And so... Prayer is something that as we do it, we see it's not just, we can even see here, it's not just manipulating God or asking him to do something or changing him. It's really is changing us. Yeah, we're praying God to change his name, but the first person that is going to be affected as we pray any of these is you and me. It shapes us. When we pray that God would make his name glorious like this, it's first going to lead us to ask if our life If our words, if our actions, you know, are they consistent with that prayer? Do we honor God in our lives and in our prayers? Is God hallowed in our own lives and in the things we say? So the first thing we're going to do is look at our own lives. God, am I glorifying you? But the second thing we'd look at is evangelistically. This is where we pray for the gospel to go out into the world. Our great prayer is that others would hallow God's name, that they would know him as creator, that they would know him as their redeemer, that they would know his love, that they would worship and glorify him too. Our prayer is that he would do all the things that he does for his own glory, especially in our lives. It's really saying, God, glorify your name. But it says a lot about what even as we look at our own lives, we say, you know, whatever happens, Lord, decide in my life, my hope and prayer is that you would be glorified. Am I going through a time of suffering? God, my, t- my prayer is that you would be glorified. God, is there a time of blessing that I hope would go on forever? God, my greatest hope is that you would be glorified. Whatever it is, is that we're saying, God, be glorified. Let, let me lift up your name and others around me. So this really informs all of our prayers. You can almost look at it as, as just, you know, having its effect on all the other ones that we're going to pray, um, all the other of the six petitions, all the other five. Um, it really affects all of them because it steers them. All right, the second petition we see here, and that's question 102. And you know what? I realized in the last one that we could read this responsibly. So 
I mean, it's kind of built to do that, right? So why don't we go and do that? I'll read the question, you read the answer. What do we pray for in the second petition? In the second petition, which is your kingdom come, we pray that Satan's kingdom may be destroyed and that the kingdom of grace may be advanced, ourselves and others brought into it and kept in it, and that the kingdom of glory may be hastened. So the whole Sermon on the Mount is about the nature of the kingdom of God. And so that's what Jesus established when he came, and, but it's really just started. He inaugurated it. And this prayer is that it would continue. The prayer is it would go on, uh, ultimately to his consummation, but that we would be faithful citizens of that kingdom. And so when you pray this, uh, you know, you're praying that God would continue this great work in the world. The great work started by Christ, that he'd build his kingdom in this earthly world. He would expand his rule, because this kingship, you know, where, you know, we see where is the kingdom? Kingdom is where, everywhere where God is ruling. You know, that's where a king is. And so we want to see his rule to be expanded over this hostile world. We see people living under that, under his sovereign rule, which is good. Now, if you look at the, the catechism, it's helpful for us because it shows three uh, kingdoms that we're thinking about as we pray. Three aspects of this kingdom. The first is Satan's kingdom. It's because the Bible, if you look at 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, it says that Satan is God of this world. 1 Corinthians 4.3 says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In this case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. What does it mean that the devil is the God of this world? We see here that his work is in blinding uh, people to the kingdom of God, blinding unbelievers, blind the nations, to see God as creator and to see God as redeemer. And instead of worshiping God, it leads them into superstition, leads them into fear, giving in to addictions, uh, giving in to money, the love of money and the pleasures of the flesh. Uh, they are blinded though to the things of God, but maybe very aware of the things that are happening in the world. And so what do we pray? We say, your kingdom come. We are praying that Satan's king work would be destroyed. We're praying that God would open the eyes of unbelievers, to open the hearts and minds of those who have been blinded by the devil, who are giving themselves over to all those sins. Apart from him, we pray God to open eyes. And how do we do it? You know, how does God open eyes? He does in the preaching of the gospel. Romans 16.20 reminds us this. Romans 16.20 reminds us how this is the preaching of the gospel which crushes Satan. Romans 16, 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. He's talking to the church. He's talking to the church in Rome. He's basically saying, you know, God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And prayer is the central way that happens. Satan is, is crushed in the preaching of the gospel. Satan isn't crushed in political action. But this is something that God does in the spread of the gospel to pray for uh, the fruitfulness of our pastors, our missionaries, our Sunday school teachers, our parents in the sharing of the gospel. This is the very purpose of the coming of Christ, in fact. You might remember in Genesis 3, 15, God said to Satan how he would be destroyed. I will put enmity, God said, between you, the devil, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. Her offspring is ultimately Jesus. He, Jesus, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So the ultimate end of the devil is to be crushed under the feet of Jesus and his church. And so our prayers, as we pray in the will of God, are right in line with this, um, right in line with what God's purposes are. We hope to be seen, unraveled. Satan's kingdom is unraveled, replaced with another kingdom. That leads us to the second kingdom we pray for, the kingdom of grace. We're praying for the spread of the church around the world. We're praying that Satan's kingdom would be replaced with something else, that people would know the forgiving grace of God, that people would receive Jesus Christ as Lord. They'd follow him as a redeemed people. We're praying that we would be part of this also. We'd be part of this kingdom. We pray that others would be part of it. God, build your kingdom. I want to be a kingdom citizen. I come under King Jesus. Pray that others would come under King Jesus his rule would be seen over all the world in every facet of life. And we pray that God would keep us in it. 
We, we could not keep going if it wasn't for God's preserving grace. And so we say, your kingdom come. You know, we're asking that as persecution and suffering and, mar- and marginalization and even success comes, we say, God, preserve me in it. And so we pray for the church, we pray for the persecuted church, we pray for the marginalized church, we pray for evangelism, we pray for the work of missions. There's a third kingdom that we might think of as we pray for your kingdom come, and that's for the the kingdom of glory. See, the kingdom of Satan, or the kingdom of the world. Um, We see the uh, kingdom of grace, the third is the kingdom of glory. This is the return of Jesus and his kingdom. It's a desire to see him to come and to set up the new heaven and the new earth, one where there is no sin, where there is no evil, there is no tears. You can look at Revelation 21, verses 3 through 5. You see how it's described. It says, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall be mourning or crying or pain anymore for the former things have walked away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. That's the world that we pray for. That's the kingdom we pray for. And so we can earnestly pray uh, in Revelation 22, 20, uh, where we say, uh, Come, Lord Jesus. We hear that he's coming. Come, Lord Jesus, and hasten that prayer. Maybe sometimes we say, Well, I hope that Jesus comes back. I just hope I do this, this, and this before the day of Jesus came. When I was in college, I, and I was definitely thinking about that. Um, but, you know, that's an unbelieving prayer of mine. It's an unbelieving prayer of ours. We want God's kingdom come. Where sin, evil, death, and the devil, they're thrown in the lake of fire, all the enemies of God, and we receive new glorified bodies, live in heavenly glory, live with God, and, and the world, and all that's in it is made right and made good. Mm-hmm. Let's see. I think I'm going to wrap it up there. I got more, though. So I'll just spread the Lord's Prayer over the next few weeks here. Actually, Pastor Sam's preaching next week, but we'll pick it up after that. But, you know, we talk about this kingdom that God has made. You know, who is it that makes God our Father? It's Jesus Christ, through faith in Him, that we come under the fatherhood. Of God. Who is it that has established his kingdom? Jesus Christ. He is prophet, priest, and king. He is the one who's come to rule over the nations. He has given his life on the cross. He was raised from the dead, and he was set at the right hand of God that he would rule over his kingdom. Right? He has made it. It's a kingdom of grace. It's a kingdom of life. Away from evil, the destruction of this world, away from Satan and his plan, that he has established his kingdom. He has crushed Satan under his feet. And by his grace, he's brought us into that kingdom. Do you know what it means to know God as your father? Do you know what it means to be part of the kingdom of grace? If you don't know that, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you won't know either of those. But by believing in him and trusting in him, you can know God as father. You can know what it means to be part of that kingdom of grace. And if you do know that, do you let the fatherhood of God instruct your prayers? Do you say first, God, let your name be great. Whatever is happening in my life, God, my marriage, my kids, my job, hallowed be your name there in the church, the government. God, make your name great. Make your name great in America. Hallowed be your name. Would you bring a revival? Would you bring uh, people to faith in Christ? Or do you pray, God's kingdom come. God, would you build your church and destroy the work of Satan that is around us? How do we hunger for that? And, you know, what would we say? You know, maybe you feel like somebody around you is, is making bad decisions, going in the wrong direction. Say, God, your kingdom come. Bring them into that kingdom. Help them to know Christ and all that he's done. Help me know and help us pray like that. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for this model that you've given to us, this model of prayer. Uh, as we think through it this week and maybe in future weeks, we pray, God, that you would instruct and inform and fill out our own prayers. God, that we can um, really pray um, in a way that you've given to us. Father, it's, it's, um, we're so privileged that you've given us a model, um, that you show us what matters. Father, we're, we're aware as we pray through the Lord's Prayer, how limiting 
and limited our prayers often are. We just ask you to expand out our prayer life and help us to think through the many things that we could be praying for and thinking about, to write those things down, even over this week, to put on a piece of paper or put on a, a, a note card or on a prayer list, to just make sure we pray about things which are outside of what we've been thinking about. Um, and so just, Lord, expand our thinking as we consider prayer for our own lives. And we're thankful, Father, for your son Jesus, who does bring us to know you as a father, who has helped us to know that we can glorify you, who has brought us into your kingdom. God, our life and our hope is granted only in him. So, Lord, thank you for your kindness and love to meet with us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is the Lord's Prayer. So let's uh, stand.